these come from. Um, and this is work by uh, myself, Elish Cornan, and my uh, colleague, Sandrine Taillard. Um, OK. So in this talk, we'll sketch the origin story for those epistemic adverbs like maybe and peut-être uh, in French that arise from epistemic modal verb constructions uh, along the lines of it may be that and then the embedded proposition. Um, so we'll link these adverbs to both adverb and modal verb grammaticalization pathways. pathways. And when we were doing this, we discovered there's an interesting uh, puzzle. So this grammaticalization uh, seems to create maybes and peut-être's uh, but not must be's and doit être, so not these uh, necessity modal verb um, constructions. Um, and this is an unexpected asymmetry if, if this is purely a syntactic grammaticalization. Um, so to try to explain this, we're going to appeal to pragmatic uh, asymmetries between possibility and necessity modals, um, which affect their usage and their acquisition. Um, and so we think this may play a role in um, this particular change. Okay, so let's talk a bit first about modal verbs uh, that create the source constructions for these adverbs. So modal verbs like English may or must or French pouvoir and devoir <coughs> express possibilities of various kinds. And um, they do so in two major forces. So you can have a weaker possibility and you can have strong necessity, um, stronger necessity. And they also do this in two different flavors. So you can have root modality and epistemic modality. So consider example one. The children may play video games after dinner, or the children must do homework after dinner. The most natural interpretation here is one where children are allowed to or are obliged to uh, do whatever uh, is in the uh, predicate. Um, so root modal flavors link to the actual world. So they have to do with rules or abilities or goals. Uh, that differs from the epistemic uses of these modals like we see in two. Um, so the children, so where are the kids? The children may be in their rooms or they must be in their rooms. Um, where here we give a likelihood estimation, either a weaker one or a stronger one, about um, what we think is true based on our knowledge or our evidence. So these are um, these epistemic uses are speaker-oriented inferences. Now, in Indo-European languages, broadly, modal, modal verbs are lexically specified for force. So that is may is always possibility, must is always necessity, uh, but they're variable flavor. Uh, and flavor uh, is constrained uh, by the context, um, but also by the syntax. syntax. Um, so just adopting here um, uh, Valentina Akal's analysis, um, there's only one, she analyzes that, that there's only one may, there's only one must, but they have an event variable. And this event variable needs to be bound in the syntax and will give rise to the specific flavor interpretation of the modal. Um, so when the modal is interpreted below tense and aspect, it's bound by aspect and it's interpreted in its root, uh, in a root flavor. Um, and more important for us is its epistemic interpretations. Um, when these modals are interpreted above uh, tense and aspect, they're bound by the speech act. And you get that speaker-oriented epistemic use. And note also that they're scoping over the whole proposition. So these are variable flavor modals, um, but how can a speaker, how can you make them unequivocally epistemic? Well, there's one fairly easy way to do this, which is to scope them overtly another over another proposition to kind of force them to give, show their epistemic uh, flavor. So if you look at the um, drawing on the right, we have uh, may being used in a biclausal construction here. It may be that, and then you have the embedded proposition. Um, so these are where this, essentially this uh, matrix clause here is where maybes come from, is where maybes get grammaticalized from. And I want you to note as well that in some uh, languages, um, uh, notably uh, in some Slavic languages like Bosnia and Croatian Serbian, um, the modal verbs, uh, this is the way to get a uh, epistemic interpretation of the variable flavor modal verbs. Um, so once these are grammaticalized into adverbs, um, these adverbs are considered sentence type adverbs um, and they're flexible, but they're flexible in their position uh, in the in the sentence um, and they can also stand alone uh, in response to uh, questions. So here's some examples from our case studies on uh, peut-être and maybe. Okay, handing it over to Sandrine. 
Okay, so uh, within the uh, epistemic language, so we saw that there are uh, those adverbs that can uh, actually play this role, right? So express epistemic language. So there's much literature actually on adverb formation and adverb evolution. And uh, adverbs in general is a very elusive class, right? It's, they're hard to define, they're, they can be, they're hard to cir circumscribe. So that we kind of made it easy for ourselves and really focused on a very specific uh, type of adverb. So um, the one Ones that we're interested in are the ones that are derived from those modal verb modal auxiliaries and like Elise just said they're uh, sentence adverbs and sentence adverbs they their definition is very similar to the epistemic definition that we just saw so they're very speaker oriented and uh, syntactically they're considered to be high like within the IP domain uh, Chinque uh, puts them in the specifier of uh, mode epistemic which is fairly obvious and then in terms of semantics they uh, um, they uh, entail like possibility, likelihood, these kinds of things. Uh, Trogut and Dasher calls them uh, call them modal adverbs. And in terms of uh, when we talk about maybes and peut-être specifically, Swan calls them low probability modal adverbs in contrast with high probability modal adverbs, which would be probably or sûrement, certainement, these kinds of things. So. These adverbs, like adverbs in uh, general, actually can be um, diachronically formed in three ways. This is based on Ramat and Rikat's really big study, typological study that they did looking at virtually all uh, European languages. So they found that there's three ways that adverbs are formed in the um, history of languages. So as a regular kind of derivation with the specific morpheme that creates adverbs. So you see some examples in English, possibly, possiblement. Well, the English one might actually be a borrowing from French, but you, you still have that morpheme that makes an adverb. The second one is the conversion. So the same uh, lexical element can either be an adjective or an adverb, depending on the context, and it doesn't have any uh, morpheme uh, indicating the, the, the specific category. Or the third one, which is the one that interests us, is the idiosyncratic formation. So univerbation, relaxification, uh, that's how Ramat and Rika calls them. We, almost all of them actually, when we look, we can, can consider them uh, grammaticalization uh, processes. So they come from different types of phrases. You have examples from prepositional phrases. These are not exclusive, they're more than that. Uh, but just examples here, prepositional phrases, like in English perhaps, or from verbs, the ones that we're actually interested in. So in, in English, maybe, in French, protect. But what we actually found out is that English and French are not the only uh, languages uh, that uh, have these maybes and protect coming from uh, modal elements, epistemic modal elements. As you can see now, there's a lot of different uh, European languages that have exactly the same thing. So they're based on that modal that has the epistemic meaning, and they are either appear by themselves or with another element, auxiliary type thing or, or complementizer type thing with these kinds of things. And these are all adverbs, right? So we're really within the adverbial uh, class. So these exist, but what we don't find are those um, adverbs that are based on necessity modals, okay? So we find the possibility ones, but not the necessity ones. But we know that stronger force, so those necessity um, epistemic adverbs, they exist. They're just not formed in the same way. They're not formed through grammaticalization from a modal um, element. So to actually understand a little bit where they come from, we went back in history and, and tried to see uh, um, uh, how far they go back, these adverbs. Um, so in terms of epistemic modals, so where, where do we, when do we find them first? Well, as early as Old French and, and uh, Old English, actually, we, we see some epistemic uses. So we're fairly early in the modal cycle cline, which we'll come back to later um, in the talk, but they are rare right and uh, at the beginning so you see here an example of a necessity modal uh, the devoir in french dates from uh, the 14th century so it's already middle french so you can see that they're rare there there are some uh, examples of them but they're rare 
for the positive possibility models, they're a little um, easier to find. So with may and uh, pouvoir in French, um, there's still not the majority, uh, the majority variant, but they're, they're easier to find in um, older um, periods of the language. So you have two examples here in Old English and one example from uh, Old French, Old French from the 12th century. So these actually are examples of modals interpreted epistemically, but that have that biclausal structure, right? We didn't add, we didn't actually uh, uh, modify the structure to fit the old languages, but you, you see the, the idea, right? So um, then the maybes and the petites, so these adverbs, when, they, when did these uh, appear? So we see that in French actually very, very early on. So as early as old French, so during the 13th century, they were, they were already there, but not only were they there, they were already very common. So they were acting, the, this uh, construction here was really acting as an adverb, okay? Not exactly the same as what we see today, but fairly similar. Okay? We did a little search at the Basse de Francais Medieval for before the 13th century, we found 450 occurrences of this uh, construction. So they're very um, uh, common. Um, we know it, it doesn't seem to come from Latin. Guggenheim says that it's not impossible that Latin had it, but it's, it's not, there's no, not really any traces from it. Um, uh, but so it seems to be an innovation from French, but it's, it's, it dates back from the very first uh, um, uh, very early in old in, during the old French period. For English, it's a little later, so you we find some uh, occurrences in, during the 14th century, but they're rare. It, it only becomes common in the 19th century. So either it becomes productive during the 19th century, or it becomes used in text during the 19th century. Right. So. What it means, all of this. Um, so, what does it take actually to go from a from a, a epistemic modal to an epistemic adverb? Well, it seems that the pro it's the properties of the source constructions that make it that make it possible. So, a, we have to know that a proto prototypical uh, use of a modal, a pro prototypical epistemic use, sorry, of a modal comes with certain characteristics. The first one is it. It's very, very often used with a state of verb, most of the time to be. And it's also, uh, also very often used with an expletive or an inventive pronoun, okay? So this actually are the characteristics that help a speaker interpret a certain sentence epistemically rather than in the root meaning that is often more obvious, right? So we, we see this and we see this in uh, old, uh, in well, Middle English, um, Middle French, and even Barbet in her study uh, of French, she studied pouvoir and devoir um, in medieval in medieval French, and what she says is that um, that epi the epistemic use of pouvoir is always um, impersonal, so always comes with an expletive pronoun, and almost always comes with the verb to be already in uh, uh, medieval French. And she actually links that to the early um, appearance of peut-être during the 13th century. We kind of do the same. So we say that maybes and peut-être come from these prototypical um, epistemic uses of modals. And um, this leads to the reanalysis. But interestingly, this reanalysis actually did not affect the syntax because the adverb actually has the exact same interpretation that the double, that the biclausal construction um, had. So moreover, so the, diachronically, you also, we also know that with the expletive pronoun, it's, it's easier to kind of omit or, or it, it's easier to fall uh, wh while the construction actually grammaticalized. So it's, it's, it makes it a little more obvious that, that maybe and not come from these prototypical um, constructions. Uh, okay, so um, this syntactic reanalysis from a biclausal construction to uh, the adverb uh, phrase adjunct on a monoclausal construction, um, we then asked, you know, where does this come from? And, and more, more specifically, could child learners be responsible for this? Um, so as is, as is the case at Diggs in general, uh, we assume a child innovator approach uh, to syntactic reanalysis. Um, and we ask, you know, could, could children make maybes? Um, and thinking about this more broadly, do children ever treat 
um, instances of what we know to be biclausal constructions from the input language as um, adjuncts on a, on a single phrase or adverbs with a single phrase, um, a single uh, TP or, uh, CP or TP. Um, so very generally, we know that children take a long time uh, until age four or older to show adult-like uh, CP and embedding in their production and their comprehension. Um, and more specifically, I did some work with Dunya Veselinovic on uh, BCS children. Um, and we saw, we saw this was true for the BCS uh, biclausal um, uses of epistemic uh, of the modal verbs of the language. Um, there's also a lot of debate over uh, child uses of clause embedding verbs, um, most particularly and most relevant for our, our look at epistemics, um, lexical epistemic verbs like think and know. Um, so very many uh, acquisition researchers argue that these are uh, initially parenthetical in children's speech, which would be somewhat consistent with our adverb um, uh, analysis. Why do they argue that? Well, because children persistently, so above and beyond uh, with other constructions, they persistently omit the subjects, uh, the complementizer, and they use them with mini minimum, minimal variability in, the, in, their, um, in their morphological form. Um, so it's, plaus it's cla uh, plausible, excuse me, that children sometimes uh, treat biclausal input constructions uh, initially along their learning path as monoclausal. Um, so we wanted to give you a taste of this from modern children. So we're looking at uh, lexical epistemics uh, in the acquisition of French, and this is really as a proxy, right? So absolutely, we're aware that there are some differences here um, than with epistemic uses of the modal verbs. Um, but we're going to show you some French acquisition uh, data from the Paris corpus. Uh, this corpus includes six children and their parents. Um, and we looked at the verbs croire and penser, so believe and think. Uh, and the parents use these quite a lot, and the parents use them as we would expect, um, with no with um, no clear occurrences of complementizer deletion. So the reason we're showing you French and not English is that French requires the complementizer use after um, things like je crois, je crois que. Um, but it, when we look at the child uses of these, children use these variably um, with and without the complementizer, um, and uh, at least one of the children. Uh, consistently before the age of four, uh, she uses these without the complementizer. Um, so we're going to show you a little example of adorable Anne doing that. You quite love Oh, no complementizer. <laughs> Um, and then also in uh, other work with Dunya Veselinovic, we did an experiment with um, preschool aged BCS learning children. Um, and when we asked them what they heard, or we asked them to repeat biclausal epistemic sentences with the verb morati, must, um, they uh, recast these back to us as monoclausal constructions with uh, either root or non-modal. So given what we see uh, children doing along their learning path, we think it it's plausible that historical children could have reanalyzed input, it may be that by clausal constructions as these adverb uh, 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 or, par or parenthetical type constructions. What, what about that force asymmetry? Uh, why are we not seeing in the um, uh, as many or any uh, must be's or doitettes? So here, um, what, so what could explain this force asymmetry? So this is a, a bit trickier because syntactically, there's not really differences by, uh, by the force of the modal. There's absolutely differences by the flavor, but not by the force. Um, so here we want to appeal to some semantic pragmatic differences between these modals. Um, so consider if we're, if we're considering whether or not it's raining and we don't have direct evidence. So you can't use the modal expressions when you're actually like looking out the window and uh, looking at rain. But if you're considering whether or not it's raining and you're thinking it may be raining, you're considering multiple possible worlds. And in some of those worlds, it's raining. And in some of them, it's not raining. But rather, if, you, if you're thinking it must be raining, that is uh, akin to um, in all possible worlds, it's raining. Um, but why are you saying must then, right? So why aren't you just saying it's raining? Well, because you have indirect evidence or you're making some kind of inference to that, uh, to that assertion. Um, so notice here that must p, so must proposition, pragmatically competes with the plain uh, assertion. So it must be raining and it is raining are felicitous in the same environments. 
So children um, struggle a lot with this. <laughs> so we have a long literature dating back to the uh, early 80s showing that children struggle in particular with, the, with, uh, with must, epistemic must sentences, and especially um, when they are contrasted to plain proposition, uh, the plain uh, assertions. Um, we see this not only with me, uh, with must, we see it with other epistemic modal verbs, and we see it across languages using different kinds of experimental tasks um, and really persisting into the early school age. Um, so uh, just to kind of illustrate this briefly, um, this is um, from work I did with Ana Perez Leroux. We had children look at either direct or indirect evidence scenes. Um, so this is boot prints in the mud, and they heard one puppet say, uh, the is sentence, so Scott is wearing his rain boots, and one say the must sentence, Scott must be wearing his rain boots. Um, and notice that there's an evidential component here, and this may contribute to why kids uh, learn this so late. Um, but the data showed that adults were very happy um, picking the must sentence when they had indirect evidence, and of course never picked it when they had direct evidence. But five-year-olds absolutely hated it. They completely avoided this sentence. Um, we have less evidence from production at this age, but it, but it also seems to be um, uh, consistent. So when we do look at production data, um, we see that children um, prefer epistemic adverbs and they prefer possibility modals in general. Um, so children use epistemic adverbs from extremely early on, so from age two. For example, uh, Violet from the Providence Corpus says maybe grandma made this when looking at a, a craft on the, on the couch. Um, and so they use these productively and in very adult-like ways earlier than any other epistemic category. And they persist in preferring these um, through their preschool years. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, when we look at the input to children, Okay, when we look at the input to children for epistemic um, adverbs, we see that uh, parents are using 75% weak adverbs like maybe and possibly, and 25% uh, stronger adverbs like probably and definitely. Um, but children use 95% weak adverbs, um, all maybe, and only 5% probability. When we look more broadly at modal verbs in both their root and epistemic uses, we also see this same possibility bias um, that's present to some extent in the input, but more exacerbated in the children. Um, so, what are, so what's our story here? So putting this all together, diachronically, we see that the initial stage is a biclausal construction, and then the more uh, innovative stage is the adverb construction. Um, but we think children along their learning path may actually first analyze input uses of a biclausal construction as the adverb construction, and perhaps, and then later they'll, they'll come to acquire the target construction. But when children acquire the target construction, they continue to use um, their earlier analyses. So they don't just like abandon it wholesale. Um, and so we want to kind of combine this syntactic learning path and suggest that children continue to use this grammar. Um, and then kids talk to other kids and you get this peer to peer, um, perhaps reinforcement of these non target grammars. Um, and then if kids continue to reinforce this grammar with each other, it may actually actuate, so a spread and catch on in the community grammar in such a way that we can um, begin to see it as an innovative grammar. And this is what we want, this process of actuation is what we want to appeal to for kids perhaps um, uh, preferentially creating maybes over must bees. Um, because kids get possibility earlier and talk a lot more about possibility and may do so with, may do so thus more with that um, innovative construction. Okay, some conclusions. Okay, so tying this all together. So we show that um, maybes and petite, they come from a biclausal um, construction and they became epistemic adverbs scoping over uh, a clause instead of being a clause themselves. And then the we, we also saw that the asymmetry that we saw that puzzle between maybes and mustbes that don't exist may be explained by uh, the semantic pragmatic differences between uh, the, the, the models. And we saw that with child acquisition data, both in production and comprehension studies might actually give evidence for this, uh, for this fact. So 
we want to finish by getting it back to the, the, the kind of historical syntax part. And, and we can't talk about this topic without mentioning the modal cycle. So for us, you know, like the modal cycle is very well known. It's been well studied. And, and uh, for us, what's really important is the, the, flavor, the flavor variable stage of the Klein actually. So you see that semantically when the cycle actually goes like historically, uh, you see it goes from a lexical root and then it becomes flavor variable at first First, it's more used with the root meaning, and then there's the, this variation between epistemic and root. And as time goes by, the epistemic interpretation uh, becomes more and more common for these uh, models. And this is where actually um, the change to an adverb can happen. Oh, me, right? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, right, so this final stage, um, we get uh, the modal verb uh, becoming um, an adjunct um, uh, high, um, high in the clause, so above, uh, above, the, above a whole clause, um, becomes an adverb that is adjunctival. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter what subtype of functional verb um, the, uh, the source construction is, because we'll see from French and English. Um, so by the time these arose in English, there was already changes um, ongoing in the English uh, functional verb structure. Um, but French uh, uh, created the um, adverb much earlier, um, and, and French is, is still um, a, a lower functional verb than, um, than the English modal verbs. Um, and then that last syntactic grammaticalization step, the modal verb may take along with it other morphemes um, into the new uh, adverb. Um, so we see this with the B morpheme in French and English. We see it with uh, the that morpheme in uh, BCS, so mojda. Um, and then in other languages, for example, in uh, Romanian and uh, Polish, uh, we just see the bare uh, verb. Um, so in that kind, in the third singular or default form um, becomes uh, the adverb. All right, uh, vielen Dank. Uh, <laughs>